All right, and I'm back. Ooh. And I'm back. I'm on my main screen here. Found it. I, <laughs> I got this up for, uh, for why we're doing this. Because it allows us to do cool things like mapping on graph paper. Anyway, uh, we're going to go back here a little bit. Oh, right. That's what I said. We're going to talk about this. So. Change this up a little bit. So let's give our game a uh, working title. Working title. Anyone got any suggestions? Working title? I want to make cartography jokes, but I don't think that's the right thing. Not making spice and dice. <laughs> That's on there somehow. Um, how does the game encourage slash reward us? Well, you literally can't, you have to, to make a map to progress. And by progressing, can succeed. First one to find tech and leave wins. Hmm. All right. So we have that. Talk about some of this stuff. So, you can't focus on everything. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what I wanna focus on in terms of this game at, with this design at the moment. So, got some very complicated ideas here. And they are. They're complicated. Um, but there's a few that I can I can totally show you, like or totally eliminate right off the bat. So, for example, game is a soapbox. We're only gonna do. Uh, we're we're gonna have that not be a primor priority. I'm not trying to say. A, I'm not trying to say anything about social context. With this game. I'm just not. Um, challenge. Game is an obstacle course. That's literally what this game is. So this is going to be a three for us. Right? Um, discovery. Game is uncharted territory. Again, priority. It's an exploration game. We're trying to, to, to see new boundaries. Um, game is an unfolding story. Probably a two, because it's not, it's not not a priority, but it's also not our primary focus. How the narrative develops is going to be up to the players and like certain things, but it's not the main gameplay mechanics aspects of our game. 
So how many points do I have out right now? Six, eight, nine. So I have a potential six more points and five categories. So that means that to me, uh, the other five categories are going to be ones except for one, which can be a two. Um, I think that's probably going to be sensation. Game as a sense player. This game is going to have detailed audio, uh, detailed descriptions of rooms. Uh, it's going to have a lot of visual elements with map making. Um, and thinking about it now, when I was saying this part about having their own maps, I don't think this will work. Only because I'm trying to make this game accessible. So, for example, someone who ha is visually impaired is not going to be able to deal with their own map in the same way that other players are. But they might be able to deal with um, descriptor, audio description of, of how the game is progressing. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say that probably not uh, because of accessibility. So yeah, there's that. Um, the other thing is, is uh, it's going to get weird trying to track where people are, but maybe that's why we would like to have it uh, be multiple maps. So yeah, there, there's those elements as well. So there we go. This is what we're doing. It's not, uh, we're not doing any real heavy fantasy. Uh, yeah, it's a fantasy setting, but it's not like um, detailed social interactions or like really crazy world building. Uh, it's very confined, it's very basic. Uh, game is a social framework. Um, it's a competing game. It's a little bit more board game-esque. Uh, so there's not a ton of role playing and and social things in the same way. Um, and yes, I went with spice and dice because I have nothing else at the moment, so it'll do. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then game is mindless pastime. Uh, that's not really a priority uh, for me. Uh, I, I think it'll be fun. I, I think it'll be a pick up and play sort of style thing. I don't think it'll necessarily be a big, like, a uh, lot of time devoted sort of thing. So we'll see. And it might just be interpreting that category rush, but fair enough. Um, and keep in mind, this is a design, an RPG sort of style design. and. The game that we're proposing is an RPG. It's more of a board game RPG than a standard role playing game. Uh, probably more in the vein of like old school Dungeons and Dragons, uh, or advanced Dungeons and Dragons, or like the board games based on Dungeons and Dragons, uh, like Lords of Waterdeep, or uh, some of those, like some of the starter sets had miniatures and stuff. Kind of like that. It's more like that sort of style than it is a like pen and paper, role-playing game, just a rule set sort of game. But so this this works. Um, this section, however, on allocated authorities is a little bit different uh, simply because it's... Um, there's there's not going to be a GM, and, and with the board game elements, it kind of takes away from these things. Um, so for me, I mean, this is a 9 to 12, so we'll see what we have to play around with, but um, there aren't really going to be NPCs. Um, actually, that's not true. There might be NPCs. So we'll say either for that. Um, statements are true in the fiction, only the game master. 
Oh, right. So we're gonna the way we're gonna approach this is we're gonna say that the game master is the rules, and not a specific person called the game master. The game master is the rules themselves. Yeah, uh, Johnny, I was talking about uh, this. Allocate nine to twelve points, and the reason we allocate points is because you can't concentrate on everything in a design. It's impossible, you don't have time. And a lot of times when you create, especially when it comes to role playing games and certain things like that, trying to hit everything just gives you a big giant book that no one uses and is not useful to anybody. It's, it's you just, you can't do it. You can't hit everything. It's, it's and if you try, your, your product is gonna suffer for it. Um, so what we're doing with the points is we're, we're kind of allocating who has a like who has authority who contributes how is the like what elements are we going to emphasize uh how complex is the game going to be uh stuff like that and and these can change right like we, these will change over the course of the design um so uh for me uh, the rules state which facts or statements are true. Um, the rules state how scenes begin and end. Uh, so yeah, that's seven. Definitely ones at least. Um, controlling the spotlight and tension in the group. I think it's going to be a two because either the rules or the player themselves are going to dictate how those interactions go. Um, so that's one, two, three, seven, ten. I have two more possible points if I want to use them. Um, I think this one is going to be two. And I think that's it. I think that's what we're going to go with. We're going to go with an 11 here. All right. And then complexity, 9 to 12 points. Um, this is going to be a short game. Uh, it's not going to be a long game. It's going to be kind of a single session thing, I think. Uh, that's, that's what I want it to be at the moment. Uh, but there is potential with this kind of design that you could just continue exploring dungeon, the dungeon for many sessions. Uh, but for my focus, I think it's going to be a one. Uh, I think this is going to be a three. I think with the maps and the way that the maps are going to work and stuff like that, that is going to be a little bit novel. It's going to be complex. Uh, number of participants, the way that we discuss this in the design course uh, was that a one would be five people, like a general f four players plus a game master, whereas a three would be like a group of 20, like a big LARP or something like that. So for us, I think it's going to be a one. Um, so that's five points. Uh, I think relationship is going to be a one because uh, it's pretty just much like just antagonistic. You're fighting everything or you're against everything. Um, character stats and traits, I'm looking at a 2 right now, because uh, I think we're going to have some and some special powers and stuff, but we're not going to have a ton. Uh, so I think that's a 2 for me. Uh, so that is 8 in total, which means we need at least a 1. Um, maybe a 2 here. Not sure about that. Uh, but we'll see. I'll leave that as a one for now. Because we're setting up the setting in the rule set and in the initial like setup of the game, we're not really changing the setting a lot. Um, like it, it and, and, and I'm not planning at the moment of having a really like long drawn out setting uh, setup. I think it's gonna be very much like, oh hey, you're explorers, you're in a dungeon. Explore the dungeon, that sort of style. Uh, 
but we'll see, right? Like, there's a lot we can do with this kind of thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and save a copy of this. Excuse me. Save it to there. Oops. Save. Yes. Oh, whoops. That was a mistake. Whoops. <laughs> Uh, that was bad. Alright. I'll have to go back and change that afterwards. Uh, so this is kind of what we're looking at at the moment. Um, and I think it gives a, a better idea of, of the areas that we want to focus on in terms of the game design. Uh, and the questions, and the kind of questions we want to ask. So yeah. Let's talk about this a little bit. Well, actually, let's, let's do some live examples, sort of, a little bit. Oh, we need a dice roller. We need a dice roller. Let's get a dice roller. All right, so let's talk a little bit about materials. Uh, a game obviously requires materials to play. So in our game, or in this game, my game, I guess, uh, what are the types of materials that we're going to use? Um, we're going to use uh, materials, materials. OBS so I can see how far it is. So we're going to need the rules, graph paper, writing utensils, six sided dice. Um, We'll say that this is a one to four player game. So we'll say five to six six sided dice. So these are what you need to play. And the reason I think it's important to talk about materials is because the easier it is for, like, the more likely someone is to have something available to them, the more likely they are to play your game. If they need more things, if they have to go out and purchase stuff, it's less likely that they'll play your game. Right? Uh, it's kind of like Warhammer or something like that. It's cool to buy the rule book for 60 bucks or whatever, however much it is. I think it's actually more expensive than that now. But then you have to spend $200 on an army, uh, number of man hours, on, uh, like 100 bucks on paints and modeling supplies, and then you gotta spend time assembling and modeling them and painting them, and then you gotta bring them to the local shop and compete in a two and a half to three hour long game. Like, that's a lot of investment. There's a reason that only hardcore people play <laughs> games or shop games, because that's a lot of investment. This kind of game, I don't want it to have a heavy investment. I want people to have things that are accessible. Right now, the only thing that people probably wouldn't have, like, the only thing that people don't necessarily have in their house is the graph paper, right? So yeah, 
There are sounds coming out of my headphones. I don't know why there's sounds. Weird. Oh, strangeness. Yeah, but it's like it's like you won't necessarily have six sided die like sitting in a drawer somewhere, but you could raid them from Monopoly. Or you could raid them from somewhere. Uh, five to six is probably a little bit more like you're more likely to find two in a board game like that. But you can get them from places. Like places like things you probably have. Um, as well as you can buy like a, a, a six pack of dice from the dollar store for like two dollars. Two dollars Canadian. So that's probably like a euro, maybe. Um, so like spending a euro is a lot different thing than going out and spending like 20 bucks on dice. As well as like they're accessible at places. Like you can go to the dollar store, you probably get them at uh, certain, um, uh, what am I thinking? Like you, you'd probably be able to get them at like craft stores or like Walmart or like general stores, just stuff like that. They're pretty accessible. Same kind of places that sell like playing cards usually have dice and stuff. Uh, things like that. Oh, and the thing I'm hearing is myself. There we go. I had a random window window open. So confused. So yeah. <clears throat> um, what else am I thinking? So yeah, materials. The more accessible they are, the easier it is for someone to play your game. Uh, the easier it is for someone to play your game, the more likely it is that they'll play it. Um, just a general game design rule. So there's certainly that. Um, And, and the reason that going with something like graph paper with the players designing the game, or, or drawing the game, is A, it, it, it brings a certain level of, care, of uh, player interaction, player engagement with the game, as well as it doesn't require any sort of fancy map making stuff. Like you don't have to have expensive printed tiles or uh, pre-made maps or like certain other things that would cost you or the players money to make um, and factors into it, right? So, yeah, I say graph paper. Well, you can go and buy a pad, at, like a, a graph paper notebook for like $2. Like you can, it, it's, it's accessible. And, and you don't even necessarily need graph paper. Like I'm just saying graph paper because it has squares on it. You can theoretically use white paper uh, line paper, any sort of just general paper. Um, so we're going to actually change this. We're going to say paper, preferably graph paper. But yeah, just paper. You just need a, you just need a, a page, a printer paper. I, I can guarantee you that, that people have those in their house at this point. <laughs> it's accessible. Trust me. So yeah. Um. <laughs> right? Uh, but but I've, I've spent some time, not nearly as much time as I've spent on writing, but I've spent some time learning about design, learning about game design. And, and the things that I'm talking about with material don't necessarily apply to um, video games in the same way. Um, specifically, uh, I guess in a lot of ways you can kind of, uh, you can kind of equate it to, uh, things like polygons and resources. What kind of graphics card do you need to play this at the top quality settings? Uh, what technologies can you, what 
technology barriers are there for your players? Um, it's kind of the same thing, right? Like, there's a different type of mindset towards making a game that's only playable by people with $2,000 plus machines than there is for games played on mobile devices. Or can be played on uh, your tablet or your cheapo laptop. There's a, there's a different mindset that goes into that. Um, so you kind of have to think about, you know, what, what's required to play your game. And video games can be a little bit different with that, where they can say, well, at best quality settings, you can play it with this kind of, this kind of hardware. But on medium, you can play it on, on most kinds of hardware. Um, you can do that more in, 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 in a video game. Whereas in a board game, you can't really, or an RPG, you can't really in the same way. But that's also why RPGs tend to be very accessible to people, uh, especially in minority communities, or not minority communities, but uh, impoverished communities and stuff. And they've been doing a lot of studies with that, with, with bringing role-playing games to communities. Uh, but where you can, you can give them a $40 book or a $20 book and a pack of dice and some some writing stuff and, and they can just go and play right and it, and it, it doesn't require that level of investment um, so yeah I don't know these are, these, these are important things to, to take into consideration when you're talking about things um, yeah So, uh, in thinking about how we're approaching the game now, uh, when we're looking at this setting, uh, are they trapped in the dungeon? Or are they starting at, um, I guess this is more of a gameplay aspect, but are they trapped? In the dungeon, slash ruins, or do they start at the entrance? Entrance. This has different connotations for for how the game will play out. Um, with what's the end goal? So if they start at, the, at the, the entrance and then work their way down, and then they have to work their way, then they have to work their way back, right? Um, is different than they have. They start in a random spot and they have to find an exit. Um, and then your tables, your your randomly generating tables. Have to account for entrances and exits. How do you find one? Um, when we're talking about randomly generated rooms, uh, especially especially the like where you're picking up a table, does that mean that the table then has can you just pick an exit at some point? Or is there other conditions that need to be met before you can can find an exit? I mean, perhaps the exits are part of the searching the room action. Right? Where you need, um, there's, there's a part of that role that, that requires you to find an exit. Right? So on my room content table, uh, or let's say 
searching table, we'll have things like tech. Traps, nothing. Exit slash entrance. Right? Just put a couple of basic traps here. Spike traps, pit traps. Poison, yes. No, I don't want to do boulder traps. I don't, anything like the problem with like boulder tracks and, and stuff, traps and stuff like that is then you have to kind of uh, you have to account for uh, it moving from room to room, and I don't really want to do that. Um, Maybe moving walls, moving walls maybe. That's something. It's easy to read. So this table, not being related to the entrance exit that you'd find here, this is about uh, the number of doors out. Contents. Uh, this is going to be narrative stuff, I think. Uh, sets the scene of the room. Right? So these are the tables that we kind of we start seeing, right? Um, Having it on graph paper means that you can do some interesting things like saying that uh, like four by four room, stuff like that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, but it can also be things like stone, room, wood, study, wizards, wizards, I don't know, towel, just descriptors of rooms, um, so things like that. I'm going to make another... Oh. We're going to set this up to here. I'm going to make another thing. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about accessibility here. It's going to be my accessibility tab. I spelled that wrong, as usual. Uh, so in terms of accessibility, this game is extremely accessible. to the hearing impaired. Spell game, right? Let me just go back and check the uh, game chest stuff a little real quick here. Go down. Um, right. Oh, okay. This is talking more about uh, writing the rules 
to be accessible to different people. But I'm I'm thinking about it as well in terms of gameplay, like what what elements of this game are aren't accessible to people, to different types of people. Uh, I think that this game is pretty acceptable, is extremely accessible to uh, colorblind. Uh, to the colorblind. It's right in the same language. Um, you can pick whatever color you want. Like, it, it's just a pen. You can use a black pen, a white pen, whatever. Uh, I, I think that that elements, those elements are inherently accessible. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, I'm not sure at this point if this game is accessible to the visually impaired. There's some very heavy visual elements. I think, or at least the way that I'm approaching it, having narrative cues in the tables, like, other than your location on the map itself, I don't think that there's, like other than the map itself, I don't think there's any other elements that can't be done through red, red dialogue or uh, reading the table out loud to someone who is visually impaired. Um, like, for example, we're not going to be drawing tables necessarily in the, the specific room. You can if you want, but it's not, it doesn't change how the game is played. Um, so there's that. Um, so then it becomes a question of how, how can we make the map accessible? And because we haven't quite covered it yet, um, I'm gonna put it in here. Go down to the bottom. Oh, oops. Uh, what elements of gameplay make the map making essential. So the issue I'm seeing here is that in talking about how how this game is accessible to the visually impaired, I've come to kind of this realization that in a lot of ways you could cut the map and still play it. And that's cool. That's cool because that means that you can kind of play with it the way that you want, saying this is the way that you would play D&D. &D. You don't have to play with maps, but you can, and stuff like that. That being said, uh, with the theme of technology and kind of my overall general idea of cartography, and that as a, te and that as a technology, um, how can I make the map essential? Right? Because, like, if it's not essential to how you play the game, then why will people do it? To have a visual representation of where they are versus where the entrance exit is? Fine. That's a decent reason. But, yeah, like, what elements are there? And this is something I don't have an answer for right at the moment. Um, I don't have an easy fix for making the map essential. Um, but it is something that, that is worth considering.
But but this problem is also kind of what I was talking about, where this is in it in essence this is a role playing game, um, where if you cut the map and the map making gameplay sort of elements, you can still play this game in a in a fighting fantasy style, right? Um, where you can or or in a Dungeons and Dragons style, I guess, where you can say, well, this is what the room looks like. I search the room, I do this, I have combat with this orc, like, you can do that without having to necessarily have visual elements to it. It's in your imagination, right? Same as a more traditional role-playing style game. Um, so there is that. There is, there is that. Um, so yeah. Um... What else? What else can I expand on here? I've used two of the ingredients. I've used sketching, um, and I've used uh, light or sunlight. And oh, sorry. Uh, and it's interesting to me. Again, kind of continue on our topic of accessibility and making the map essential is the only way that I've made the map essential is to the ingredients of the design competition. Right? Like, that's what I've made essential. Um, it's not essential to the gameplay itself. But I think it should be. I think, I think it's important to have all your necessary elements be essential to it. Or, or why, were you, why were they there in the first place, right? I don't know. Something, something I'm considering. But I mean, in a sense, if you're playing cartographers in a role-playing game, um, you're still approaching the technology and map sketching and all that from a, a role-playing perspective of, of playing your role, of your role being a cartographer. So I guess it still is part of, of the game, even if it's not a physical sketch. Um, your characters are still technically making sketches of maps uh, within, within the narrative context. So there is that. Saving grace. Saving grace. Well, excuse me. Um, so... We're going to say something about player characters. Uh, I'm going to switch these. Okay. So player characters. Um, I do want this to be pretty light on character creation if there is character creation. Um, because yeah, uh, I, I, I want this to be a pick up and play game. I don't want it to be, oh, we're going to, we're going to start playing this game and it's going to take us 45 minutes to make a character. Uh, and then, you know, like we know everything down to the sides of their biceps, like. That's not super interesting to me as, as, a, as a, a player. Uh, I know some people are into that. There's some crazy games that have you calculate a lot of stuff. Um, most of which are not safe for Twitch, so I'm not going to mention them. But there's some crazy, crazy stuff out there. Um, but yeah. Uh, Pre-gen to me seems like the best option. Because uh, you can kind of have like a bunch of diverse characters, and I would say if you were going to do pre-generated, you would have more characters than the maximum number of players. So probably something like six to eight characters if you were going to do it. 
to give your players options, stuff that suits their play style, uh, different types of things. Um, so there is that. What kind of stats are they going to have? Um, well, we already discussed combat stats a bit. So we need some measure of damage or strength. Uh, some way in which we can indicate that they've done damage to an enemy or uh, their weapon skill or something like that. Uh, hit points. Hit health. Points. Uh, some way of tracking how much damage has been done. So things like traps and all that stuff can can incapacitate you, um, and that'll be kept track by the players. Oh, that's another interesting note. Uh, it's important to know who keeps track of what, and how much they're keeping track of, because the less that someone has to keep track of, the less things that they can mess up, and the the easier it is to play a game without having to deal with number crunching and certain other things. Um, which is why I was saying like four to six sided die, four to six six sided die, uh, dice, because it means that those numbers are fairly easy to work with, and they can only go up to a maximum of like thirty six, as a number, uh, so it becomes much easier to calculate. Uh, so yeah, uh, having individual players track their own health and stuff like that makes things easier as well, because that means you don't have one person keeping track of it, you have individual players keeping track of it. Uh, so everyone's got to keep dragging a smaller number of things. Um, so some sort of skill uh, test stats. Um, maybe like climbing or uh, running maybe, uh, disarming traps. Assuming you find them, you might not. Uh, oh, that's an interesting point. So, we have our randomly generated tables, right? Uh, and we're sort of using them to set the scene of, of the... Of, of the players and what's going on. But what if we uh, had... Uh, What if the active player only saw the first pick? Saw their own pick, actually. And the rest are hidden elements. See, this seems more interesting to me as 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 gameplay uh, as a gameplay aspect, because it means that if there's traps or if there's certain other things in the room, that the player wouldn't find them. The the the, the player who's who's making the choices, the action, the active player, wouldn't necessarily know about them until it was too late. Uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, it's one of those things where it's it's not nearly as challenging. To um, is not nearly as challenging if you have all the information. If you know that there's traps in the room, why would you not attempt to disarm them? But you can't know if there is or isn't if it's secret. If the the pool is secret, right? Or or you know that there could be potential traps, and you might even know like what options there are on, a, on, a, on the table, but you don't necessarily know all of the information. So that's something to consider, right? Um, yeah. Information secrecy. I 
I can't spell at all today, apparently. That's what I'm trying to spell. And, and the same kind of goes for things like finding technology. Oh. See, this is interesting. You could theoretically, um, you could theoretically have, if you have four players, have five maps. One global map uh, drawn on by the active player. And each player having an individual. So then what happens is, is each player marks their own map with the thing that they've selected. And that information is only revealed when it's relevant to a dice roll. Right? So then you have information hiding. Uh, and say like the player beside me has traps on his and the player beside him has an enemy in his and then like that. And so it's one of those things where Oh, I'm gonna search the room. Oh, you find a you, you 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 find a trap, and there's an orc that comes out of the next room. Like, things are revealed as as you go. Now, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind is, uh, where's the onus on players to not just force combat? Like, you want to give the players options that are just as valuable that aren't necessarily just killing the other players. <laughs> uh, so there's certainly that. Excuse me. Um, so there's that thought for me, as well as, um, how do you get around, uh, every one picking the same thing? Do you force, uh... Do you force it basically? Uh, do, like have phases, almost where the first player picks the size, the second player picks the content, third player, etc. You can you can do it like that. Um, you could also um, um, I had a thought. What was it? Oh, 
I remember now. Right. Um, so the other thought I had is if um, if the information is kept secret, uh, you you can then have this interesting dynamic. of the three, the other players conversing about their tactics. Like a little, like a, a huddle almost. And make their choices. Though, uh, that gives more information to the inactive players which might not be beneficial right sorry that and I agree with you chess diver uh, there are ways to make combat less attractive for sure the problem is is if combat is inherently a choice in how you design a room then how do you, like, what options can be, are more attractive? Um, especially if we're talking about a, uh, a game with a single clear winner. Right? And, and yeah, and, and making the options mutually exclusive is exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to, like, phases. Um... So yeah, the other way we could look at it uh, is you could increase the dice pool. I don't necessarily want to do that, but you can do that. Um, uh, where the first dice, the first die is the category. Uh, Rooms, traps, enemies, etc. And the second is the specific item. So, like hit trap, fork, etc. So that's the thing, but then you have to have more dice and you have to roll more dice and you gotta keep track of it and like certain things like that. So I don't think I really wanna do that, but that is an option. And it might be necessary in order to uh, balance gameplay, maybe. I mean, in Fiasco you do that, but Fiasco, the dice rolls, you do like two or three times per game and the dice pool just stays on the table for the game. So that's the thing. Um, Right. But anyway, it's nine o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna take another five minute break. Um, I'll be around in the chat if you want me to ask me questions. Uh, but we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna take a five minute break and then we come back and we're gonna do the accidental book club and a few of the other things to kind of wind down. I'll review what I've done uh, so far as well. So yeah, um, five minute break. I'll see you all at five.